Christmas is such a wonderful time of year for everyone else on YouTube. Seems like every other media niche has a near endless supply of Christmas content worth celebrating in the form of derivative video content. But for anime, there's Tokyo Godfathers and that's basically it. Sure, plenty of TV anime do Christmas specials, but the most that those ever accomplish is capturing the general vibe of hanging out and opening presents with the fam on the morning of, and most are just Valentine's specials that took a wrong turn at Albuquerque. So, year after year, I've had to sit here in my cold, dark basement, watching all the other YouTubers as they laugh and sing and play and get all into that holiday spirit that I can never have. But not this year, because this year I'm ruining Christmas for everyone by stuffing all of your mind stockings with knowledge of a holiday special so horrible that it physically maimed me. Though it is actually one of the better parts of Love Hina overall. A fact that I'll let simmer with you as we go through it to further ruin your Christmas with all the lingering implications. But first, I've got something to show you that I am honestly more excited about than anything else I have ever done on this channel. As you may be able to guess, I love me some figurines, and I am quite proud of the elite selection that makes up this collection. So when U2s reached out asking if I'd like to work with them on a Mother's Basement vinyl figure, I jumped at the chance. But I also vowed to make something that I'd actually be proud to display alongside all my faves, with everything that I personally look for in a figure, so that you would be just as stoked to add it to your collection. Here's what we came up with, inspired by the hottest trash. My ideal figurine has one, a fun, characterful pose that looks great from many different angles, two, a non-standard, thematically appropriate base, three, attention-grabbing, creative accessories and accentuating details on both the figure and the packaging that work together to tell a story, and four, kawaii-ness and or sex appeal. As you can see, the vase in the U2's lab hit the bullseye four times in a row, and I helped. Truck-kun was my idea. Pre-orders for this one-time limited run go live on December 30th at 3 p.m. PST. But one lucky winner can nab a me of their very own right now by clicking the link in the doobly-doo and following all the steps you see me doing now, except that I didn't do the Instagram one because I, I don't have an Instagram. In case you're not the chosen one, though, make sure you save your Christmas cash for the 30th. Wait. Shit, I'm about to ruin Christmas. Really should have thought that through. Ah well, before we get into the roast proper, you should be aware that Love Hina Christmas Movie Silent Night is a direct continuation of the Love Hina TV anime. Thus, some summary of that story is required for you to fully grasp the deeper intricacies and thematic nuances of this... <laughs> Taro Urashima, the product of a secret government experiment to create the middest man imaginable, has spent several years now trying and failing to pass the annual entrance exams for Uber Elite Tokyo University, all to fulfill a promise to the only girl who ever talked to him one time back when he was six, based on an urban legend that couples who go there together will stay together forever. This ambition is complicated somewhat when his kooky old grandma entrusts him to manage the family hot 
Springs Resort turned women's only dormitory that she owns while she's on vacation for like an entire year. But that actually turns out to be a blessing in disguise, because in addition to his aunt, who does most of the actual day-to-day -day management work for the dorm and constantly makes you question why he's even needed there, five other girls live in the dorm room, one of whom might just be the girl he made that promise to. These girls include Naru Narusegawa, a trendy tsundere who hits Keitaro with her fists every time he does something stupid or pervy, Motoko Aoyama, a traditional tsundere who hits Keitaro with her traditional Japanese weapons whenever he does something stupid or pervy, Mitsune Kitsune Kono, a sultry, squinty, miserly alcoholic who constantly hits Keitaro and everyone else up for money, Shinobu, a literal child who constantly hits on Keitaro, and Kaula Su, a... well, it's kind of hard to describe her in concrete terms, so imagine if you stuffed every Indian stereotype, plus a lot of other stereotypes, into a Halloween parody middle school uniform, then fed it an entire brick of cocaine. Think Italia, but without the educational value. After he's settled in and starts to get to know the girls a little better, Keitaro accidentally walks in on them in the bath and then a bunch of violence is done to him, after which they stop trusting him completely until he makes it better somehow. And then that happens again, like, 20 times in a row, occasionally interrupted by them going on vacation to be put in more exotic compromising positions, and... Yeah, now you're pretty much caught up. Wait, sorry, there is exactly one meaningful shift in the show's status quo partway through when this flighty, voluptuous Okinawan girl with the exact same bangs as Naru named Mutsumi starts showing up as a sort of six harem ranger, mostly in the episodes where they pretend like maybe they're gonna move the plot forward and then don't. Mutsumi's job is to act as a red herring to make it less obvious that Naru's the mystery girl, but because she's the only one, her presence ironically only makes it even more obvious. Also, at one point, they introduce this absent-minded archaeology professor character named Seta and his daughter, Sarah, but his only real job in the story is to be the subject of Naru's big schoolgirl crush that complicates the early development of her feelings for Keitaro, exactly like the one Akane had on Dr. Tofu in Ranma. So, if you've seen Ranma, or any harem anime before, really, you can consider yourself officially caught up on Love Hina, or at least caught up enough to enjoy this open fire roast of the Love Hina Christmas special, Silent Eve. Wait, did I say enjoy? I mean, suffer from. Yeah. After a handy expository flashback to the playground promise for any new viewers who might be tuning in, the special proper kicks off with a scene of Naru and Mutsumi studying with Keitaro for his fourth round of entrance exams. With all three of them awakening at the exact same time, the obvious implication is that flashback must have been a shared dream, but Naru preempts the discovery of their latent psychic powers by telling Keitaro to shut up and study when he tries to bring it up. Then, after the disappointingly un-Christmassy credits roll, we're treated to another round of exposition, this time in the form of a pop idol song that the producers of this anime would very much like for you to buy on CD while you're out Christmas shopping this year. Thanks. About how this Christmas Eve is a very special Christmas Eve, because it's the year 2000, and anyone who confesses their love before midnight will have any wish granted. After that, a short millennial Tokyo winter vibe sort of montage brings us to a scene of Shinobu and her friends talking about how there's a rumor going round that if you confess your love on Christmas Eve 2000, any wish you have will be granted. You know, for the slow kids in the audience who didn't get it from the song. And then, I guess for the sake of the even slower kids than them, we cut back to Keitaro trying to break the ice in his study session by talking about how there's a rumor that if you confess your love on Christmas Eve 2000, any wish you have will be granted. 
Unfortunately, Naru doesn't bite, in part because she hates Christmas, much like the original tsundere, the Grinch, but also because she's just way too focused on her studies. So focused, in fact, that she doesn't even bother to inflict horrible violence on Keitaro when he briefly forgets that his hands are magnetically attracted to boobs, or get psychotically jealous when he goes out to run a quick errand with her romantic rival, which is weird for her. And in case you didn't know that as a new viewer, Keitaro and Kitsune both take time to helpfully point out how weird that is for her. She wants to stay and study by herself. Oh, really? Really? Normally she get all upset about you two going out together. Which is approximately as weird as it is for you or I today to think back to a time when people still needed anime to explain tsundere's to them. It's weird enough to make Keitaro think that she's finally lost interest in him for good for, like, only the third or fourth time that's happened in the series so far. However, when Sue and Sarah are busy hunting through the hot springs for hidden Christmas presents, they happen to happen upon a letter in Naru's closet next to a distinctive pink package which appears to contain a declaration of love. After gossiping about that while completely naked, you know, like you do, the girls conclude that it would be bad to share this news with Keitaro, as it might distract him from his studies. However, Shinobu, the weak one, immediately breaks that promise because she sees him being sad, and immediately proves them right when Keitaro excitedly dances his way onto the rooftop, then falls off and sprains his ankle in a moment of gag manga logic gone realistic. Naru comes in to visit and tuck him into bed, but then, when she doesn't immediately confess her feelings for him that very second, he sulks himself into a mental doom spiral about how she hates him forever now because he fell off the roof, which was the last straw after the several other times that he's done basically the exact same thing, and when she says okay bye to him, what she really means is, I'm leaving forever now, okay? Bye. So naturally, he blurts out his feelings right when she's leaving. In response, she runs away without saying a word and spends the next day studying at her parents' place instead, while everyone else spends their day sitting around naked talking about what a loser Keitaro is. Especially Keitaro. He doesn't let that stop him from buying her a present with the money he'd been saving up selling Christmas cakes, though, and as we see from her empty kanji notebook at the end of a brief transitional montage, Naru, too, ended up being pulled away from her studies by errant thoughts of that confession. She continues avoiding him when they get to the prep school, though, and even after the mock exam, she immediately hops on a train bound for Tokyo without saying a word, holding that present that we presumed was for Keitaro. The girls stalk Naru all the way to a fancy hotel restaurant in the rich part of the city where they think she's meeting Keitaro for a date, followed closely behind by the man himself on his crutches, which obviously means she's meeting someone else. And, of course, they all reach the restaurant at just the right wrong moment, right after she's handed off the present to the archaeology professor whom they all know she used to have a crush on, but right before he has a chance to open the letter that comes with it, in which she explains it's actually a I no longer have feelings for you, but thanks for everything present. You know, like you do. Thus stricken with a tragic case of the comic misunderstandings, Keitaro drops his present for her and runs off to sulk. And, of course, the elevator that Naru chases after him in goes down just slow enough that the doors open right at the moment in his crutch-fumbling slapstick routine, where it looks like he's going down on the middle schooler who's in love with him. So now it's Naru's turn to run off to sulk on the subway, and instead of sulking, Keitaro decides to run off to an amusement park with the middle school girl. You know, like you do. I know! How would you like to ride the Ferris wheel next? Doesn't that sound like fun? Um, well, Kitaro. Yeah? FBI, open up! 
Lucky for them, their friends are familiar enough with their character quirks slash criminal tendencies to figure out where they'd run off to and talk some sense into them. Or in Naru's case, give her the fancy new jacket that Keitaro bought for her since her kind is immune to sense talking. It almost doesn't work on Keitaro either, since he has to sit through, like, three whole ambiguously confession-y sentences of letter before she finally drops the other shoe, but he does get there eventually thanks to the support of his much more emotionally mature best friend, the middle schooler who's in love with him. By playing phone tag with his aunt back at the hot springs, Keitaro and Naru are then able to set up a rendezvous at the iconically romantic pedestrian bridge in Omote Sando, but then at the last second, Naru realizes she left her nice new jacket on the train by accident when she was accosted by a chocolate-coated toddler, so she's gotta run back and chase it down, leaving him waiting, shivering as the snow starts to fall. Though she does leave a message for him saying they'll meet at Shibuya Scramble instead. And so the special breaks into its exciting third act, in which our heroes must race to find each other in the densest city on Earth before the clock strikes midnight and they forever lose their chance to... uh... start dating in the trendiest way possible that particular calendar year. High stakes indeed, and with the odds stacked against them, they might just need a Christmas miracle to pull it off. Meanwhile, the other characters all need to get up to their own holiday hijinks if they want to get home. Because Shinobu and Kitsune both forgot their wallets, none of the taxis will accept Sue's weird foreign money, and Matoko karate chopped a train molester right after handing Naru the third act MacGuffin, so now she's stuck listening to some dumb cop's objectively wrong lecture on how that wasn't justified. Although, his question of what motivated you to act like that does prompt her to get all introspective about why she, the brooding loner one, would ever get involved with a romance scene that has nothing to do with her, especially on Christmas, which she also hates, of course, because Sundere's The Grinch, etc., etc. Thus, the Love Hina Christmas movie seamlessly segues into its obligatory sad scene, where the soundtrack gets all somber and synth violin-y on us, and against a melancholy backdrop of falling flakes, the characters must use their hopeful Christmas spirit to rally against the despair of having to walk through one of the most walkable cities in the world in freezing condition. Well, not actually freezing, Tokyo's way too temperate for that, but still, they didn't dress for it, so it's the worst Christmas ever! However, as Kaula Sue so Christmas spiritfully puts it, they have to keep going to make this Christmas a happy one, because if they go home now, everything will still be awful. Bit of an extreme way to put it, like, Naru and Keitaro have basically made up already. Them meeting up tonight's just a sentimental formality at this point. And you are just a child. Also, the child with you is even younger to the point that it arguably is kind of bad for her to be out this late, this far from home on a night this cold. So maybe just lay off the coke and call it, Sue? I think the adults got it from here. No? Okay. Anyway, while they're busy talking about that, Shinobu and Kitsune have a sisterly heart-to-heart -heart about how they're both probably gonna die alone, so they've gotta do everything they can to support Keitaro and Naru, irrespective of their personal feelings, because that's probably the closest they will ever get to feeling love. Nowadays, we call that a Kirito Pact. But while they've resigned themselves to that fate, they are at least spared the fate of hoofing it across Tokyo by the goodwill of their benevolent creator. Well, I mean, he, he does make them sell his shitty old computer waifu manga AI Love You for him at Winter Comiket to pay it off, and definitely gets more labor value out of them than the cost of a train ticket, so opportunistic creator would probably be more accurate, but... Yeah, to sum it up, they couldn't figure out how to end this scene, so instead they wrote in a cameo from the author. By a similar token, Matoko runs into some friends from school right after leaving the pig pen, and they invite her to a Christmas party they're having, so now she gets to stop being in the movie. 
And for their part, Sue and Sarah get out of their predicament when they run into the one taxi driver in Tokyo who's not a racist. Besides Adokawa, I mean, who also just so happens to give us the long-awaited answer to one of the longest standing mysteries in Love Hina history. Where the fuck is Shinobu's father? Meanwhile, Naru finally chases down the train car with her jacket in it, then catches a ride to Shibuya with the simpier of the show's rival characters, Kentaro. Keitaro, for his part, keeps dutifully hobbling his way toward the station, and as he does, I can't help but muse that the image of him literally dragging his foot every step of the way to a confession scene that we've all known was coming since the start of the special, and indeed the entire anime, feels somehow appropriate. But then, the cold, the strain of his busted ankle, and the disappointment of getting passed by too many cabbies in a row all catches up with him at once, and he collapses in the middle of the sidewalk, only to be rescued seconds later by Mitsumi and dragged off to a love hotel to warm up. Also, she took all his clothes off to get them dry, you see, for her whole gimmick is that she's naive and innocent, but also kind of stupid, so she does a lot of sexy things accidentally, but then she acts all ara ara about it, so you wonder if maybe it's not accidental, and uh, this scene is basically here so she can fulfill her quota of that, and the special can tick off the CFNM tag. And, of course, the scene also serves to delay Keitaro's arrival at the scramble to the very last possible moment in order to make the finale as dramatic as possible. Which is... still not very, to be honest. Not even when Naru gets stuck in traffic and has to hop on a handy-dandy compact bike that is conveniently just right there. But I can't say they didn't try, and... I guess it's the thought that counts? Uh, basically, the finale is just everyone running around aimlessly shouting everyone else's name like Jason! 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 To absolutely no avail. Keitaro even manages to lose his crutch like a clumsy idiot and pass out in the street again. But then, right when it seems like all hope of them meeting before midnight is lost, oh joy, it's a Christmas miracle! The miracle of television! Some station is doing a Christmas broadcast that just happens to be playing on the Shibuya Jumbotron, and their reporter just happens to pick Naru out of the crowd to ask why she's so lonely on Christmas, which gives her just enough time to give a heartfelt speech that ends with her saying, in no uncertain terms, that she wants to be with Keitaro forever right when the clock strikes midnight. A confession so legendarily trendy that it will no doubt go down in the annals of Tokyo Public TV history. And, of course, for anyone who's been following the anime to this point, it's a moment of much-needed and long-awaited catharsis. An end to all the blue balls right when they were getting ready to blow. At long last, closure! To close the special off, we cut to the girls reflecting on the last day's events, the practice exam scores in particular, in the hot spring sometime later. Keitaro got a B, it turns out, which makes his prospects for the exam proper look very good. But for some reason, Naru doesn't seem too thrilled about that. In fact, she's even back to downplaying his achievements as blind luck, like she doesn't even... No. No! You can't do this! You can't! She said... I want to be with you forever! In front of everyone! On television! There's... There's no way she can walk that back, I mean... I have had just about enough. I only said I wanted to go to Tokyo U with him. And, and all that means is we're just friends. <laughs> Don't worry, folks. I'm fine. That was merely a dramatic recreation of my first time watching this special as a youth using Hollywood's special effects. My testicle didn't actually burst this time, as I inoculated myself against the effects of that scene in advance by taking an equivalent dose of shoujo romance. I, uh... Probably should have warned you first, though. My bad. Merry Christmas?
Of course, you'll be used to it by now, and hopefully have a ball dock on speed dial if you've seen any of the dozens upon dozens of Love Hina derivatives on the market today, which have spent the last two decades one-upping these stalling tactics to the point that Rent-A-Girlfriend was able to status quo reset the main characters coming clean about all their lies, declaring their love for each other, and then kissing in front of their entire families, and reset it so hard that not only did its protag Kun stay pathetic, he actually regressed to being a full-blown shut-in for a few months. Still, even with as bad as this shit has gotten, perhaps because it's the original, there is a distinct audacity to the way that Love Hina's Christmas special just boots you straight in the nards and undoes the one thing it spent the last 45 minutes plus 26 straight episodes building up to, not two minutes after it happens. Not to mention the Yakuza-esque swagger with which it leans down to your sobbing, broken form and whispers in your ear, Did you like that closure, bitch? Yeah? Well, you're gonna have to stay tuned for the spring special, then fork over the cash for three different OVAs if you want it back. And I'll put you down for some dating sims while we're at it. The line that ends the actual story comes when Keitaro once again walks in on the lot of them in the changing room, and Naru once again sends him blasting off again for the transgression. At which point she says, You never change. Which sounds like an insult, but is actually the elevator pitch for the whole harem cottage industry. You will never change, never grow, never meaningfully come to terms with your own feelings or the feelings of others, or find the courage to communicate those feelings honestly. But here's an endless cavalcade of different girls, or, you know, the same five or so girls in a near-infinite range of slightly different haircuts, who will love you anyway. Or, you know, a lowest common denominator amalgamation of the collective insecurities of guys like you, at least. Definitely a tempting pitch for the young and perpetually lonely male anime fan, but speaking from experience, no matter how hard you buy into it, it will never bring you real happiness or the feelings of joy and compassion for all mankind that this season is supposed to be about. But you know what, Will? Buying my U2s! That's right, the secret to human happiness is inside this very box. And even if it's not, the FDA can't prove otherwise. So if you don't win that giveaway at the link in the doobly-doo, make sure you save your Christmas money for the day it drops, December 30th at 3 p.m. PST, because this is only going on sale once. And if you miss it, you are going to miss your only shot at a meaningful existence. Also make sure you save enough for popcorn, because I'll also be dropping the worst anime of 2022 that day. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Hina hater, wishing you the happiest of holidays. I mean, the least happy, because I ruined them. Suck it, Whoville! <laughs>